Hello and welcome to episode 31 of Airs for Architecture with me, Ambrose Gillick. I'm speaking today to a trio of lovely people, Maristella Casciato, Vikram Prakash and Daniel Coslett, to discuss their edited volume, Rethinking Global Modernism, Architectural Historiography and the Postcolonial, published by Routledge this year. Modernity, modernism, industrialization, the production of nation states, uh, scientific rationality and rationality in general, all the things of modernity and modernity are supposed to be generative of the modernist aesthetic, are constitutively entangled with the colonial project because at all instances, all these things were produced in which materially and epistemically was the colonial, right? It is therefore not possible to see the two things separately. A is for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of A is for Architecture. I'm talking today to uh, Maristella Cassiato, Vikram Prakash and Daniel Coslett. Um, would, I suppose, you try and introduce yourself, Maristella, first? I... Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you today, Ambrose. My name is Maristella Casciato, and I'm currently the senior curator, head of the architectural collection at the Getty Research Institute. So I'm joining from Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And what does uh, what does the what does your role entail for the Getty Institute? Well, it's a research institute, which means that we collect in a very different way than a museum. I mean, a collection arrive in a large uh, amount, components of, uh, for my, in my case, architectural drawings, photography, sometimes other media, a lot of uh, original drawings and sketchbooks. So, and then you need to understand, I mean, how would you, um, catalog and what does it mean to keep them available mm-hmm. and with a certain amount of good luck, possibly part of research projects. So it's a, a, a less cherry picking sort of collecting than a museum does and so on. But this doesn't mean that it's not challenging. And I'm supervising the acquisition, basically, and the research projects related to acquisitions. And this becomes a publicly accessible archive, does it? Or is it is it specifically for a kind of subscription based? Um, it's not a pub- it's not a public resource. No, no. I mean, it is whenever it's possible and more and more. It's a public resource. No, I I mean, the archive is open to the public and uh, and uh, and you come to the reading room you right now you have an appointment to mm-hmm. schedule and you see the original materials when cataloged and then there is a, a strong very robust but this is not only the case of the getty research institute robust uh, project of digitization and uh, put them online that's lovely I'm very, very envious. It's my favourite place to be in archives, and it's been about three years since I managed to get into one. So, uh, yeah, it's really good. Daniel, um, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for having us all. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Daniel Coslett. I'm a scholar of colonial and post-colonial architecture and urbanism in North Africa. Uh, but my background is actually in, well, distant background is in uh, classical archaeology uh, and related fields of heritage management and tourism. But for uh, about, uh, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years, I've been teaching architectural and art history out here in Washington State at a couple different universities. And I am soon to be uh, an assistant professor of architectural history at Drexel University in Philadelphia. So gearing up for this transcontinental move. So you were trained as an archaeologist and then you transmogrified into an architectural historian. Yes, so my 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 background was in classical studies and archaeology as an undergrad and I did a Fulbright living in Tunisia for a year doing excavation and research on Roman urban planning and Roman architecture. And while I was living in Tunis, living in the sort of 1920s French colonial core of the city, I became sort of fascinated with what was going on all around me in a place that I confess I knew very little about prior mm-hmm. to that 
time. So uh, I, I was doing my excavations in Lamta on the coast uh, with a team from Canada uh, and doing my research, but sort of always kind of paying attention to the buildings and decided at that point to switch into architectural history. So Amazing. I came back to the US and did some studies to get caught up because prior to that I'd studied nothing past Hellenistic Greece. <laughs> so I had to uh, get caught up quickly, uh, which I did. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, this gives you a very solid foundation. Is this, uh, were you looking around Carthage and, you know, where Scipio Africanus ground everything into sand and then salted yep. it? Oh, yeah, I was spent, my my fun days on the weekend were spent at Carthage running around and sort of visiting the sites and having mint tea and pastries and things out there on the coast. I was living in the in the in the center of the city uh, uh, and the, the most of the archives and research centers that I was working with were there in the city center but Carthage was and remains a, a lovely little afternoon or day trip out from the city so astounding so so wonderful and um, Vikram you last but not least um, Vikram Prakash could you introduce yourself thank you so Ambrose, thanks for doing this and fellow, being a fellow podcaster on architecture. Uh, such a delight to have this conversation with you. I am a professor of architecture here at the University of Washington in Seattle and, though, and an architect by training from, from Chandigarh, India. But uh, I function mostly as a historian and theoretician of, on issues in uh, modernism, global modernism, global history in general. And now I'm trying to branch out into the relationship between fashion uh, and architecture and, and, and other such topics. So well, I think that's, that makes kind of sense of what that kind of follows. So we may as well name drop your father immediately and get that done with, <laughs> get that awkward moment out of the way. Aditya Prakash, your father who worked with Corbon on Shandigar. And other yes, projects was, as well. Yeah, he was part of the uh, original capital uh, design team, one of the eight Indian members who built Chandigarh, uh, and uh, and on, and on a couple of projects worked closely with Corb, and then went on to design cities of universities that were part of the agricultural green revolution, uh, part of the Kennedy transfer of of. Uh, side-laced technology to boost agricultural production in India. And uh, yeah, then he, then he retired as, uh, as the Dean of the School of Architecture in Chandigarh. But he moved uh, and he did a lot of painting in his later years. And so you're moving into he, fashion. He was, a, he was a prolific painter, yeah. prolific painter. Uh, he painted a lot uh, about, um, yeah, I have about uh, 150 paintings and about 600 drawings. That's not counting all that he gave away, sold uh, uh, all over the world. And, uh, and, and he was a writer. He wrote several books uh, and he was a photographer in his time during the 60s and, uh, and was active and very active in theater. In fact, as well, he was an amateur theater person and designed a series of theaters, which was his true passion. Uh, and in fact, died uh, when he, he, was, uh, he was on a train headed to Bombay with a group of uh, young theater people uh, when he was 85 and everybody else was like 30 something. And he was on a train uh, in the middle of the country when he died of a heart attack. You know? <laughs> so amazing. Yeah. I've taken a train from Bombay, from Bandra station in Bombay to, to uh, Mumbai to, to Ahmedabad at um... Yeah, this my... was much longer. He was from That's... Ambala to Bombay at 24 yeah, yeah. hours. I mean, it was long enough. It was long <laughs> enough. Worse still, it got we got to we got to Amnabad, and it was I was woken up at two o'clock in the morning by these very, very, very scary looking policemen walking down the carriageway with batons banging people awake. And I got <laughs> turned out in Amnabad, which was a long way from Buj, where I was headed. In, oh. at two o'clock in the morning without a word of Gujarati to me. <laughs> and I just allowed a man to take me by the hand and take me. So I thought, well, you know, hung for a sheep as a lamb. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm in the, and uh, I ended up where I needed to be, but about, yeah, about 24 hours later, but it was very good. Anyway, we're here today talking about this great book um, that you've edited, um, Rethinking Global Modernism, um, Architectural Historiography in the Postcolonial. And, um, 
I suppose it's it's a really fascinating read, and for me it's really important because I'm trying to get my head around this kind of moment, this political, social, political, cultural moment that we're living in, which is a long time coming and is accelerating and is building momentum and is leading to a series of um, meaningful changes, I think, or hopefully meaningful changes in, in the way that we produce and disseminate um, historical knowledge about architecture, cultural knowledge about architecture. Um, Maybe we could start off by talking about where it comes from. Where did the book, what, what stimulated the, the birth of the book? I mean, me asking you about your backgrounds was one way of kind of pointing to that, I suppose. Um, but maybe Maristella could start by talking about that as you're one of the editors. And, and also because you wrote the introduction to, to the recent book uh, on, on Vikram's father um, on Continuous Line. So I've read that as well. So you can... Well, there are several... Thank you for... Uh... First of all, starting, it was my uh, beginning, I mean, with uh, the idea to say something about the book and where it comes from. But there are, of course, uh, several lines that go directly, well, not dot points, but one continuous line between um, myself, I mean, and Vikram, and then through Vikram, I met Daniel. Um, we had a, an interest in Chandigarh, and I know this will be also something we can discuss. I mean, the, the city of Chandigarh, authorship and Corbu. Uh, but um, there has been something uh, that made myself and Vikram become um, quite good friends in a certain way, more than colleagues, more than colleagues. And to share some interest uh, in what India has been after 1947. But that was not the origin of this book, though Chandigarh comes in the, in the book. I mean, um, the origin was uh, a more, let's say, didactic pedagogical approach in a certain way. Um, the, the Society Architecture Historian annual meeting, the idea to have uh, a session with speakers and on the topic of the post-colonial and decolonization, and then find out that the respond, which tells you a lot about how many people or younger generation, not only our generation, are interested in this topic, there was a very, very large response. I mean, mm -hmm. for a session that includes five speakers, uh, Without exaggerating, we had something like 60 proposals or about that. So what does it mean to select? And what do you select? And what is the idea of selecting? Proximity, geographical proximity, same time um, frame, I mean, uh, chronological frame. We did, we made a decision because the chemistry of a session in, a, a, in an international conference, it's always very relevant, how, who talks about what, but immediately from the very first moment we said, and Vikram, you can add more, or Daniel, when he was involved, there is more here that we can put together. We need to reconsider um, more of these voices, because definitely modernism has many, includes many contradictions and many self-critique, but post-colonial, uh, post it's even larger than that. So post-colonial modernity, modernity. So we, by the end, we started talking among us and then with many of the uh, colleagues or not yet colleagues of those who responded to the call for papers. And that's the practical, if you want to say, how do you start an anthology? Because it, an anthology is not like only collected essays. An anthology is a construction, maybe analogous to a building. I mean, it's a construction of voices, but also different material. So, what does it mean? Thinking, voices, I mean, uh, ideas. Um, and it was quite, I have to tell you, an interesting exercise, I mean. This is my first anthology. I know it's not the first one for Vikra, and he has another different experience, but I really learned a lot on how to work, as I always say, 
with, I mean, different topics, but create this uh, proximities and the piece of a puzzle that is going to be reconnected. Um, I think Vikram can add more on this. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, I think and most also covered... Daniel, yes, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, the, 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 how it came about. But as you said, Ambrose, the overwhelming response we received for our J for SAH panel made it clear to us that this project of uh, decolonizing, if you want, the uh, Eurocentric history of modernism this project, which has been ongoing now for a little bit of time, its R was here very much. So it's seen as a as a do as as a project that needs to be done, that a lot of people are working on, have a lot of interest in, and that is clearly urgent for our times. So uh, the response suggested that, and of course, uh, so we thought, well, how to capture that response and, and further that discourse. Uh, and in the process, as much as possible, bring in new people, the younger scholars and other people who have been working on it. So we thought, uh, you know, we see like, where are we in this thinking beyond things that uh, established scholars have already written? And I think that's how it happened. I think that's a really nice word, this idea of an urgency. We use the word timeliness over here, which I've always found a sort of washed out word, but urgency mm -hmm. is really interesting. Daniel, was it, I mean, coming from your background of, really, really, really old things. How do you get to, I mean, where does your motivation for this come from? I mean, for me, as someone who's teaching so much right now, I think and we're all, you know, all of us have taught either in the past or presently <clears throat> or currently. So I think for me, it was just really wanting to find out what is being done now and what can be immediately applicable to the classroom mm -hmm. um, because there is so much change going on and the very nature of this type of discussion is diverse and is global. And so what's I think interesting about this book, well, many things I think, but it is by its very nature necessary that this book be big and complicated and long. <laughs> the, the process of trying to kind of corral it into a sort of nice package was certainly a challenge. And I think it has to be a challenge. I mean, it, 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 it is a constant battle, I think, to fight the desire to compose sort of narratives and fit everything together in this super sort of elegant way. I mean, we try and one tries to group essays together to make for a sort of impactful package, but uh, it's unwieldy. And I think that is inevitable. And so, um, I mean, I think for me, it's just exciting to sort of see what people are talking about and how you can create narratives that are useful and sort of compelling for students and readers, but still maintain that kind of messiness and that kind of complexity that that we're trying to, to represent. So I think, you know, yeah. it's a... You know, so do we... If I can add one sentence, I mean, of course, the pedagogical impact of an anthology like this, it, is re it has been always relevant, and that's part of the urgency. But if you notice, in a certain way, because it was for us very relevant, there are five sections, if you may say five large group, I mean, grouping, but all of them purposely leave an open end. I mean... I mean, it doesn't say that this is the answer. Those are voices within this grouping. And that's why I have to say, and then I find it very important for us, we ourselves, we tried different way of grouping because we every time had this idea, this is not going to be a Bible or a gospel. I mean, this is going to be voices that are urgent right now. I mean, and you may add more. And I, I think that might be something that, that I consider really relevant also in the position of someone like uh, some of us still open to the teaching, I mean, and approaching younger generations, I mean. I really, uh, yeah, that's really fascinating. Thank you for that. I. You, your use, Maristella, of this, of this word voices, I think is something that you, situates the 
discourse that you're developing, that you're opening out um, in, in the kind of climate of the everyday, that there's this kind of, that the post-colonial, the way that I'm reading it, I suppose, is that the po post-colonial is orientated against the monolithic ideas that have characterized historiographies of, of, of modernism and of modernist architecture specifically. I mean, the book has that quality about it. So going to what Daniel was saying, that there's the desire to kind of neatly round this thing off and present it as a, as a, as a perfect thing is, is very tempting. But at the same time, it, that would kind of deny the nature of the subject to hand, which is that it's unbounded. It's fragmented, it's hybrid, and it's, uh, you know, it's Homi Baba's idea of, of hybridity, isn't it? It's, it's, not a, it's not a thing, it's events or it's processes or it's praxis or it's identities. I'm not sure. It doesn't, it's very difficult to describe. So you give yourself this enormously difficult job of creating a book about post-colonialism. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Ambrose, you know, so we've been through this period where the grand narrative or the big narratives and the Eurocentric big narratives, mentally, things that were colonizing, epistemic colonizing, taking over big stories and making them into monoliths, right? Mm -hmm. ...of that was to open up discourses and to introduce uh, a diversity of voices and to underline the idea that voices and representations are in a sense infinitely diverse and constantly need to be opened up and that all narrative uh, and that narrative is net, never settled, that the story is never settled and it's constantly critiqued and reproduced and remade. And that has been, you know, a, a great thrust, which we have been experiencing, I don't know, for at least two decades, maybe three uh, in historiography. But at the same time, you know, it is critically important that simply diversification and introduction of more voices and newer voices is not the project as such, you know, as you were over a certain extent. I don't, I'm not sure if you were, but uh, perhaps implication in what you were describing. The product, the, the, the necessity of producing meaningful narratives that do tell other stories of what modernity and modernism is, is just as important as making sure that there is diversity of viewpoints and adequate representation. Uh, so that the project simply doesn't dissolve into a, a, into a praxis, but is also a, a production of narratives that are, uh, if not stable, certainly uh, 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 productive of multiple subjectivities, right? I mean, they tell things that happen and stories and lives of people in a manner that is not simply descriptive of one more, but I do cohere into some kind of narrative. So mm -hmm. I think that's the challenge. That's the place we are at now, mm -hmm. that how do you start to tell narratives that are global, post-colonial, decentered and decolonized without simply saying, well, here is one more perspective which establishes yeah. that a monolithic Eurocentric perspective is not valid. We got that. The issue is now, what are the other stories? And yeah. How do we tell it? Yeah. And that's a, it's an important issue, isn't it? Because if you go around endlessly fragmenting, what you end up with is just tiny little bits. And right. then the big monoliths are still there because no one's fragmenting. And, and, and at present as absent, because mm -hmm. once again, you have... Uh, the sort of deconstruction of the Euro, uh, of the big monolithic narrative as the empty center. Mm. Uh, even if, if it's an empty center, it still remains the center. Yeah. So that's a problem. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's really the transformation of this duality of the center and the non -set. I mean, it's what's happening even today. Uh, if I may go to very present time, I mean, you are in Europe. I mean, you had the big empire, and we don't have to know which one, we all know. Then you had the, 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 a, a, a nation of many nations, and then those became 
uh, independent. And now you reverse again because independence, it's causing problems. So you want to reintegrate. I mean, it's this constant moving transformative situation. And I think that if look under this perspective, as I want to quote I mean, uh, Vikram once, I mean, that, I mean, uh, the project of decolonization never ended, I mean, because of this center and non-center that disappears and comes again. Now we are thinking to have new book, almost I'm thinking now, should we not invent, but start thinking, Vikram, of a new vocabulary? Uh, do we need another taxonomy at this point? I mean, what, where do we go? And, mm. and this is specifically for, not for the people that write the big architectural history books, but for the young students that come to the classes. How do they present themselves? They have to write a paper, they have to present the paper. Both David and Vikram have this experience. How do they talk? I mean, what is the mm. vocabulary that they use? It's really, and um, Daniel, I did want to ask, I wanted to start off. So I sent through three kind of question bundles, but I was reading through again today and I was thinking about something that sprung out at me from one of the papers I was looking at. It was Alone and uh, Nitz and Shifton. <laughs> yeah, funnily enough, I gave a paper with, in a, in a session with her at the European Architectural History Network in Edinburgh a year or so ago about some of the work she was doing around at the Middle East, Israel. Anyway, she, reading her thing, it, the big question that jumped out is that this, in, when we're talking about post-colonialism, but m more specifically this modernism that is at the heart of it, we, do we have to differentiate between the political project of modernization and the aesthetic practices of modernist architecture? Are they two separate things? Can we, can we blend them together? Because I think the critique of modernity, so you see this in the work of say, for example, oh, Marx obviously and Weber and, and Hannah Arendt, who I'm particularly fond of. And, um, and in Peter Berger's book, Facing Up to Modernity, you see this kind of description of modernity and modernism, moder modernization as a very distinctly political entity. And then what we're talking about in architecture is a very distinct other thing. And I'm kind of, I would kind of like to know a little bit more before we start talking about the first question that I sent you, but where you see, whether you see that there is a different, uh, there is a, a gulf between these two things or whether they're one and the same thing or par parts of the same. Yeah, I mean, I would, I think trying to separate them is almost impossible. I mean, I think that the, the everything is political, of course. And so any type of modernizing project is going to be inevitably political in its very nature. And certainly anything that's happening in a colonized or occupied context is going to be highly politicized. And so, I mean, I, I for me, trying to separate them is almost futile, but um, I, I, I mean, I think I, from a teaching perspective, I have to constantly remind my students that that modernism is not an aesthetic. I mean, it can be, and of course, it becomes uh, aestheticized in a certain way. But that when you know, the same way I encourage my students not to worry too much if they quote like <laughs> yeah. an architecture or not, I encourage them to remember that there is idea, uh, sort of, there are ideas and and theories and perspectives and goals behind any kind of architectural production. And, and they may be overtly political or may be less overtly political, but they're inevitably political. And so trying to sort of separate the politics from the product, I think is. But is, this, is, this is a very post-colonial idea, isn't it? But this, but this is, I think, Alona's point is that the big modernist Western European and American modernism is assessed almost apolitically. Mm -hmm. And then the global south, the, col the colonized world's um, use of m modernity, of modernism, is always assessed through a political framing. And, and 
I, I'm not sure if it is her paper, actually. Uh, no, it's not. It's, Juli uh, it's uh, Juliana Maxim's paper in her in her on, um, Socialist Arch Architectures Challenge to Global, where she talks about this. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of thinking about that. And it comes back to this first question that I got, which is this idea of the colonies as the site of modernism. Mm -hmm. uh, Arendt talks about this idea that, that colonialism, you know, that there's these three things that she argues um, birthed modernity. One is the Protestant Reformation of the Catholic Church, particularly in Britain. Um, the second is Galileo looking at the stars through his telescope. And the third is, is, is the expropriation of indigenous lands through, through processes of, of colonialism, colonization. So there's this idea that modernity is actually inherently a colonialist practice, mm -hmm. um, which I find kind of fascinating. I do. I, I, yeah, I would, sorry, go ahead. Did you? No, Vikram. Yeah, no, I would totally, totally. Uh, uh, I'm, modernity is uh, constitutively entangled with the colonial project, is the way I would put it. Would modernity have happened without the colonial factual? Maybe, maybe not. But modernity, modernism, industrialization, the production of nation states, uh, scientific rationality and rationality in general, all the things of modernity and modernity are supposed to be generative of the modernist aesthetic, are constitutively entangled with the colonial project because at all instances, all these things uh, were produced in which materially and epistemically was colonial, right? It is therefore not possible to see the two things separately. Uh, and of course, uh, industrialization uh, was a key thing that uh, produced the conditions of, our, you know, urban and architectural modernism. And that entirely relied on a colonial economic um, mechanism that appropriation of indigenous lands, well, in the Americas, I mean, that's Arendt's uh, reference. She doesn't refer so much to the other colonies. Uh, things. Uh, so, so materially, that is very much the case. But I think epistemologically also, uh, when one locates a moment of the inauguration of modernity with Galileo, it is important to remember that Galileo and Quattrocento Italy was also entangled with, uh, you know, the Islamic world for, to begin with, right? And those knowledges and the production and recovery, what is called the recovery of uh, classical knowledges was also produced in a global theater. Uh, and that is not necessarily colonial, but I'm talking century over here, right? Uh, but, but as it comes down, what I'm trying to say is that modernist ideas or the enlightenment ideas or whatever kicks in in the late 18th or 19th century, thing that is uh, borrows in many ways from global ideas and transforms them in processes, via processes that, have, that were long established and continue to be built on. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, Arendt's fantastic as a classic modernist thinker, mm -hmm. but I think classic modernist theory and philosophy uh, uh, does tend to miss um, uh, the, the global roots, the global paths of modernist thinking. Maristella, do you have any thoughts on this? This idea, I mean, one of the things that's said in the book is that you say in your introduction to the book, actually, the colonies were seen as the ideal sites for innovative modern, modernist practices or innovative practices, modernist practices. And I, and, I, and I wrote in my questions, is this because um, modernism was imposed? So what we had in the colonies was a, just to come back, so Vikram, I, I take your point that modernity in a post-colonial reading has a kind of, 
it's it's more like a um like a Deleuze and Guattari's idea of the of the rhizome. It's not like a single tree root. It's more like a diffuse network. Yeah. But let's pretend for a second that the um, colonials ride into India, Sri Lanka, wherever it is, and they plant down these buildings. Is this because this is what modernity is? Modernity, even in Arendt's reading of it, is, is and, and I think in, essentially is what Marx is saying in Capital, is that it's this thing that's imposed on people. So it kind of relies upon a subjugated mass of people for its realization? Um, or is that a too negative reading of it? Is there something more positive? Because the other side of this is that you suggest that mo modernity or modernism represents a mechanism for leapfrogging the bad parts of... Yeah. That's more post-colonial modernity. Uh, you know, uh, modernity is imposed. And if you read Foucault and Marx, yes, it is imposed universally, not just in the colonies, but in sort of uh, institutionalized uh, uh, globally. But to return to your point, I do think that uh, because of the asymmetry in power in colonial uh, relations, uh, colonial sites were seen as more opportunistic for thinking the possibilities of modernity because of uh, yeah, because of more uh, uh, total, not totalitarian but of more authoritarian uh, possibilities yeah so I think was, that is correct and there was space I mean so from a very pragmatic perspective there was physical space where things could be done things could be imposed you know, buildings, cities, whole cities could be built in a way in Tunisia or in India that was just pragmatically impossible in France or in, in England or something like that. And so there's this, and that that's not inevitable. That's a, that's a created power dynamic, of course, which we're talking about. But there's also, I think the other issue here is this, not just the sort of wielding of power uh, and the sort of taking advantage of opportunities, but also this belief in necessity that, you know, this sort of colonial civilizing mission, all of this kind of thing that suggested that it was not only a possibility and it was not only the sort of quote, God given power or whatever of the West, but it was necessary that North Africa or the Middle East or India be sort of improved. And this kind of, yeah, sort of meets the sort of power dynamic and meets the perceived opportunity and then the product is something that is in dis, you know it is modern but colonial inseparably so yeah you can say if i um uh Ambro, you can i mean you introduce this idea of uh, i mean a kind of knowledge of modernity and you went back uh to the 15th 16th century and I think that it's a, a big leap, but it's where the origin also of modernity is. And of course, Vikram went to that. And I don't want to generalize, but here we come, I mean, at the big, in the 20th century, and there is this expansion, and it's not only in the colony, I mean, where the colony exists, the British Empire and so on. But there is really a, a conceptual idea that it's also, I mean, a, a, a happening in a different way, even in our Western world, in a way. So at that point, I mean, the process, uh, it's, uh, I would use this word, maybe we haven't used it much in our book of development. The process is something is happening there is a development, there is a practice, there are many actors in this practice. Um, the actors are actors as a person, but there are even the role of agencies that become part of, of this new construction. So we see how a process that started, I mean, Galileo even before, becomes more complexified and in a certain way, it's happening 
almost, I don't want to exaggerate, I mean, saying that there is no other way, but it's happening because there are all the conditions for this development. And those are political conditions as well as space condition of human, I mean, needs and so on. I see this, I mean, um, different kind of, you know, not narrative, but position that all together are working on layers. One of the top, um, one of the chapters uh, in, the, in the book is about this layer, I mean, networks and layer, mm -hmm. I mean, which, which is one of the reality of what is happening. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we are scrutinizing through this book some of these realities. Mm -hmm. um, now, you say this is a negative history, want to want to have a more positive approach. I would not go for where is the good or the bad. I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I would like to hear my colleagues <laughs> if they have an idea about how I distinguish. <laughs> I mean, in the global history. I think you're right, Maristella and uh, Ambrose. You brought it up also, and and Alona's paper in particular. This is very clear. This idea of layers is to emphasize that. Uh, 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 movements and events and things in history are 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 entangled but discontinuous, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not uh, one large modes of production analysis in a sort of a reductive Marxist sense that can be applied to everything, uh, and that things are uh, are discontinuous. And one of the discontinuities in the 19th century and early 20th century was, I would argue, between uh, modern architecture and modernity, the institutions and apparatuses of modernity uh, in general, particularly industrial colonial modernity. And one can argue, and I think reasonably so, that one of the reasons why, why uh, Washington DC wasn't remade and nor, or even Paris, even though we say Hausmann did it, uh, wasn't really made into modern architecture was because of that uh, sort of discontinuity between, let's say, relatively progressive aspirations of modernist thinking and the resistant uh, vested, uh, you know, metropolitan interests of these sites. Mm -hmm. And which is why I think that perhaps one of the reasons why modern architecture found purchase in colonial settings, but only at least in colonial times in a tokenist manner, I would argue, and was taken on as a nation, as part of the building project, certainly in India, uh, certainly in South Asia, but certainly in parts as well, uh, Brazil, you know, Ankara, Turkey, et cetera, uh, as a leapfrogging project that you were talked about, where modern architecture was uh, more, more completely uh, joined to the modernizing, industrializing, nation, nationalizing project mm. in a way that it never was in the West, mm. because there was a sort of a, a, a an argument uh, between, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jefferson's vision of what a, a sort of a modernist architecture should be, you know, just to, to use a shorthand, uh, or, or the uh, British Parliament, uh, etc. I think that's, and, a, that's a really fast. That's a really fascinating idea. That this idea, this unevenness that you get in Western conceptualizations of modernity is somewhat, somewhat, not entirely, but somewhat erased in the decolonizing. Uh, parts of the world where they instrumentalize it towards, I suppose, cultural and political visions. And, and, and the clearest example, well, perhaps the most well-known example of that surely would be Chandigarh under Nehru. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Nehru makes it into a cause celebre, yeah. right? I mean, he puts architecture in this work, well, in Brazil too, I would argue, yeah. but some yeah, of different right circumstances. Here. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and you know, uh, they tried in Israel. They try, you know, Ankara. There, there are much places, but the kind of horsepower that Nehru put behind it in India 
in the production and making of Chandigarh. Chandigarh was, it was a famous city before they had put down the roads. <laughs> By the mid and late 50s, it was being talked about and argued about and Mumford was at Corbusier's throat already. By the end of 50s, before there was anything <laughs> really on the streets. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so it be, and that because of Nehru, mm. uh, and and because of the let's say actually coincidence that Kabuzi ended up on the project, he wasn't originally meant to be as much. Everyone knows well. Uh, so it was kind of a you know coming together of two big uh, big agents, uh, uh, and that's what made uh, Chandigarh so big. So. <clears throat> There is also, again, if we can go back to your point of the, poli the political aspect of this moder modernization. If you think about Chandigarh and already, ex I mean, well explained this fight of two, these two personalities and not only that, for Chandigarh, see how much the political aspect becomes different, for instance, the case of, in the case of Brazil. I mean, the case of Brazil, okay, the Brazilia is a, like an intermediate period moment between dicta uh, in in the middle of dictatorships, and uh, and I think and I think that this is another aspect. I mean, of uh, sometimes the modern the modern can even serve political aspect that we would not be really favoring, I mean, mm. our, our, us, no? But those are also, the, the book, in the book, those layer of the political, it's, it's always there. I mean, it can be ex-Soviet Union, it can be Brazil under dictatorship, it would be the case of Chandigarh. But I mean, how do you separate the political project from the modernist project? I mean, I think it's a it's a big question again. Yeah, it, it, it sort of it reminds me. It, it, so for my first edited volume project on sort of neo-colonial, colonial, post-colonial post heritage management after lives of colonial spaces, I had chapters, authors writing chapters on architecture and spaces in Europe. And one of the reviewers said, this is a book about colonial and post-colonial architecture. You can't have chapters about Paris and Rome in this book. Uh, that's not colonial. And I had to go to bat for this and say, no, the whole point is that everything is everything. And the, uh, anything that's being built in the 19th century in London and Paris is inherently colonial in some way, or the product of a colonial system, of course. And so as much as we can try to disentangle colonialism from modernism, it all sort of really goes back. And it goes back not just from, of course, the, the colonies and the post-colonies, but into the metropoles themselves. And so, yeah, I, yeah, I, it just, it's reminding me of this. As much as we're saying it's entangled, we're trying to disentangle it, but it really is actually far more entangled, I think. But I, yeah, so I, I mean, it's, I, I could talk about this for, for hours. I mean, it's, it is a really, I, I lived in Glasgow before I moved to the south of England and Glasgow was the second city of the empire. That was, that was what it was called. <laughs> um, and it has this extraordinary um, heritage of the architecture, the urban, arch uh, uh, urban realm and architecture of, of exploitation. Um, the, the merchant city, the old city is built on tobacco and slavery and sugar. Um, uh, and yet my grandfather was born there and he was born into a family and he was, he was down a coal mine by the age of 11. Mm. So he wasn't one of the recipients of this thing, but then he became a soldier and served in India mm. um, uh, because that was how he, so, so he was one of 17 children, but 14 of them died before they were five. Of poverty, yeah. so yeah. so this could, so so what Glasgow was always to me was a post-colonial environment, but one that no one writes about, and mm -hmm. and Glasgow's decline in the post-colonial period is an extraordinary example of of that relationship, this entanglement as you call it yeah. between. Um, 
Yeah. But I but I was wondering, so so to come back to something Vikram said earlier, and you've all t- touched on this, I and maybe this is a question for Daniel uh, again as as the um the person who's spoken, I suppose, least so far. This idea of a post-colonial history, then. So if we've got this idea of post-colonialism, which has this um which is complex, entangled. How do we write these histories? Because as Vikram said at the beginning, we don't want to just simply say everything's modern and everything's post-colonial, therefore anything goes. We've got to still, in a way, elevate those actors that participated in these great moments because, you know, after a manner, it dignifies it. It also acts as a great um, amplification tool. And it's also true. So, for example, your father, Aditya Prakash, is... Um, involved in Corbusier's Chandigar project. And Chandigar is authored by your father and Corbusier as a kind of synthetic one and with the other members of the, this team. And I, I, so I was wondering, how do, we, how do we go about writing this kind of history? Daniel, perhaps you could reflect, and maybe you've got... Yeah, it's a, it's a, of course, it's a, it's a million dollar question. I mean, the, the answer, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I think... So I'm constantly, so I'm writing about French colonial 19th, 20th century North Africa, and I'm, I'm constantly wondering and thinking about how to tell this story better and meeting problems left and right in terms of availability of material in archives. And the, the, where are the voices of Tunisian or local participants in these processes? And how does one incorporate them and tell a complete story but also not be sort of limited by the archive. And this is inevitably complicated. And, um, you know, I, I think, I mean, to, to step back to this project, to this book, to this anthology, I think in a way the anthology is actually, anthologies are often sort of criticized for being loose and sort of just a grouping of papers that get sort of thrown together and there's no sort of theme and, and they don't really work as a whole. Uh, and certainly there's a lot, I think, that's fair in a critique of an anthology or an edited volume that way. But I think what actually in this context, it works perfectly because the, I, I don't think you can write a history of this material. I think this this whole approach, this post-colonial approach to modernism is by its very nature inevitably complex and, and, and multi-vocal and messy. And so... As, as much, and I'm sure most readers of this anthology will probably not read it cover to cover. I mean, maybe they will, who knows, but I imagine people will read the chapter that is of interest to them or maybe another one. Um, but I, I, I would encourage people to really think about it in its totality and read it in its complete form and, and recognize that it is not complete actually. And so I don't know how one really writes a post-colonial history that isn't many histories that isn't many chapters written by many different people that are inevitably flawed and incomplete. So I don't know. I mean, I, in my own work, I, I want to amplify voices wherever they're possible, but, you know, I also think there's value in the fact that you can't really deconstruct a colonial history until you get that colonial history out there. And so there's value, I think, in exposing what we can with what we have available to us in an archive that is incomplete and, uh, you know, flawed in and of itself. Yeah. No, it was a challenge. I mean, this was the challenge we tried to address in the introduction, right? Like we've got these micro narratives, if you want, how, but how do you package them? And while there is a lot of theorizing in the introduction, I would like to offer, you know, the two images we put in there. Yeah, yeah. The, I had to uh, say, maybe, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 uh, Meretru, of course. The, the Meretru. Uh, image. Roadmap. Okay. I mean, yeah, no, 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 continue, because this is important in the book. Yeah. Go ahead, Vikram. I mean, in a sense, the, the, the larger project is, uh, is, in a sense, more gestures. You know, there's the sort of this juxtaposition we put of the of the uh, assembly door and the Mehrutu drawing. But just now I'm talking about the Mehrutu drawing, which is the of migration maps, and the image that we put on the cover, which is this uh, you know uh, 
a, a ball uh, made out of cut up paintings uh, by um, ah, uh, uh, oh my. <laughs> Good. No, uh, the first other person, one the first person to find it wins <laughs> I don't have the book uh, I will never be able to find it at this point but <laughs> uh, but, 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 but to go uh, uh, Analia Saban Analia Saban the, the point here being you know you remember uh, D Derrida's critique of architecture in, in Kant and so on. Architecture resides in philosophy as an image rather than argument, right? That it, the idea of foundation, middle grounds, and a pinnacle, which is the architectural pyramid argument, sits as an image in, our, in philosophy of something that makes sense in terms of how to make arguments. So in a sense, it is uh, this sort of visual, a, a visual metaphor of what knowledge is, is what is produced, uh, what is suggested, I think, by these images that we put in, in, into the book. Mm -hmm. And in particular, Mehrutu's drawing, which has all these narratives, but all together do make a rich tapestry, a coherent narrative. It's mm -hmm. not simply Fissi Paris. It doesn't come apart. Yeah. It's not closed, but it is not simply, uh, you know, constant uh, disentangling, you know. So I, I would offer uh, an image rather than a, a theory or an explanation as to what, what that project is. That's really good. I'm really glad we got to talk about the drawings and the sculptures as well, because that makes sense of that makes sense of it in, in my head as well. So um, thank you for that. I, I, I mean, if we've done we've the, the issue of writing post-colonialism has now kind of, I think, infused a lot of other practice in writing. Um, it's sort of learned from sociology in a way. It started unpacking that there was a lovely book written by a woman called Jennifer Robinson called Ordinary, Ordinary Cities, which was about, she's a, she's a scholar, yeah, sociologist, and she was looking at the idea of modernity as an everyday practice. And that sociological thinking, which has been part, I think has been part of the, the post-colonial discourse, um, has, has, infu has infused almost everything. We're almost incapable now of looking at kind of histories and, and, um, and, and thinking of them uh, in that way, but it hasn't quite permeated the way that we design. And I don't know about your schools, but certainly where the way that we teach design still is, is very much bound up with one, a uh, hundred year old tradition, the, the kind of their own architecture, the, the Corbusian idea of, dare I say it, Ayn Randian idea of the, of the, um, the isolated, individuated genius working in, uh, in every context is fundamentally a tabula rasa. You've just got to ignore all of the people. And, and we, so we still haven't really got to that point yet where we're designing in a way that is multivalent and multivocal and multi-agency. We haven't learned in a way. So, so the way that you've described post-colonialism is that there is this co-creation or co-production of modernity between the colony and the colonizer. And this is very elegant and it corresponds to perhaps uh, what one experiences, if not what one reads. And that's a key, that is a key, that I think is a key, um, a key point. Scholars have labored under this kind of false architecture of modernity, whilst everybody else has been going around experiencing it in the ways that you're now describing. Mm -hmm. But how do we get to this point where we then infuse that? post-colonialism into our design world, I think is a intriguing question. And I wondered if perhaps Maristella, in your work as, a, as, a, as, a, as an archivist, perhaps you encounter this um, in ways that perhaps architecture people don't. Not really, though I have to say really, recently, I came, I mean, uh, I 
had a new archive coming in and I noticed that there was an interesting aspect of early experiencing in North Africa, specifically this is Morocco, and uh, uh, the project of the, and this is agencies again, of the Peace Corps. I mean, so you, you can infuse, I mean, something within the discourse of, uh, of the colony. But I mean, you, I don't teach architecture at this point, and I never, never taught really a studio, but I mean, there are some contemporary examples. I mean, I want to ask you, Ambro, how do you deal with a prick surprise to someone like Kere? I mean, he works what? In, a, in his own region, he works with communities, uh, he works with localities or, I mean, is this a post-colonial architecture? Is this what you want to give to your students? Um, it's, it's an open, <laughs> I mean, I'm very much interested in these questions. <laughs> and I, I would like you and maybe, I mean, um, I know that Vikram also teaches studio. I mean, what does it mean I mean, at this point? Are there <laughs> examples <laughs> that you wish to follow? Um, it's it's not yeah. surprising to have a prick surprise to someone like Kere. I mean, but what does it mean for the future next? I mean, it, it, I think it's a tremendous question, uh, Ambrose. I've been teaching studios for a while now, but uh, beyond studios, uh, and we can come back to studios. But uh, in practice. Uh, you know, we haven't even begun to start this work. Uh, mm -hmm. We are still very much at the early stage of uh, recognizing that, well, there are non-modernist, uh, non-Euro modernist practices uh, around the world. Uh, and then we recognize, you know, sort of uh, Kere and Doshi and Korea, and, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but they are all always recognized being uh, particular to their site and culture and identity. You know, what will it take to really decolonize uh, uh, modernism as an aesthetic practice? You know, when are we going to be able to teach in a studio in Seattle uh, uh, principles, let's say that come from a non-metropolitan location Mm -hmm. and normalize them into how we design, make design proposals for downtown Seattle. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just not admissible. You know, you can't take, let's say, typologies developed from, uh, you know, uh, kinetic urbanism in Bombay, as Rahul Mehrotra describes them, uh, and use those to, to, to design uh, downtown uh, uh, I don't know, Boston or, 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 or Seattle. Yeah, yeah we will we we'll just, we won't do it. Uh, those are good for there. We take our students to Bombay or when we take our students to Sri Lanka, uh, then they are good to develop for them there, but we are not going to bring them back. And this is a deep, because it's habitus, like an equivalent thing I find is, it's no problem for me coming from a post colony to wear a suit and tie and walk around. That's just considered okay. But for a Westerner to wear Indian clothes is considered to be so, so supercharged, appropriative on one side, yeah, yeah. And purely cultural tokenist on the other. You know, when, is, when, are, when are we going to be happy to wear a sari? Uh, in the West as well, not because it's Indian or culturally relevant or whatever, but because it's a damn gorgeous piece of uh, clothing. Uh, so... Uh, no, look, when I did my PhD stuff out in India, and I don't know about you, Daniel, in Tunisia, I very consciously did not do cultural appropriation. And as a consequence, I sweated so much. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, the question that Vikram is opening is very interesting. There are many successful, I mean, already in the example I gave you was in the, in the uh, late 60s, there are many successful projects, students going to Mumbai, working there, 
It's the other way around that still needs to be not only discovered, needs to be understood. What do I do? I mean, what does it mean? And where do I find the roots for that? Mm. Yeah. And how do you avoid the pitfalls of sort of postmodernist, eclectic, mm. just kind of shopping around, you know, appropriating and, and, or maybe you don't avoid that. Maybe that's, that's acceptable or, uh, you know. Or, or you, or you work through the embarrassment of the whole process. You know, that's what Baba was talking about. Hybridization is embarrassing. And so it's, but, you know, it's also productive. Hmm. But we won't do that here in the West. We won't. We but, but it's really interesting if you go to India and you see, for example, the, the colonial period architecture, you see it's very clearly in Mumbai. Hmm. It is being used appropriately, not to itself, but to the context in which it finds itself. And that I find very interesting. I have a PhD student at the moment who's from Delhi, and she was talking about how she <clears throat> uh, went to school through the Luchin's part of Delhi, in a quite, not, not in a way, I'm assuming, I'm assuming, and I think I'm right in assuming this, in a way that was uh, indicati- indicated that it was part of the topography, that part of the landscape, it was India. And I think that's a very interesting, uh, that's a very interesting thing, that it's, it also seems to be very difficult for, for that, that kind of um, psychological occupation of these things, this taking ownership of things which are, are perhaps alien a hundred years ago, but now are, now are Indian. Yeah. Now are... And in global history, in you know, pre-modern times, this was not a problem anywhere. I mean, the yeah. Taj Mahal is Persian, but we call it Indian. And Charles Correa has this uh, amazing quotation that pretty soon Le Corbusier will be remembered as the greatest Indian architect ever. <laughs> Uh, because <laughs> because his best works are over there, and if nobody will know. Villa Sabha will be crushed to no, the ground. And nobody totally will know. out of fashion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when is uh, when is uh, when are we going to be able to, you know, make of New York uh, aesthetic and urban and cultural practices? that have a distinctively, uh, let's say, Indian or African flavor. Mm. Uh, and, 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 and one can say, well, okay, yoga has been, you know, sort of made into a, a Western thing, but we get really squeamish about it. You know, it's like, <clears throat> maybe we are appropriating. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but when we, when, 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 uh, but I don't think we worry. So this is part of the, post-colonial heritage, the asymmetries of powers produce these embarrassment, yeah. asymmetries of embarrassment uh, and, and uh, fears of appropriation. But we will have arrived at a more decolonized state when these are more evenly shared on mm. both sides, right? More evenly shared and evenly enjoyed and evenly transformed and, uh, and remade. So it will be a historic day when you can introduce the Taj Mahal as a typology to design a, a new tower in London uh, in your studios, Ambrose. Uh, uh, you know. Yeah, I'll get chased out of the building. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I think that's nice. I'd written this note at the very end of my notes. I'd written um, post-colonialism coming home. And I think we've touched on this, this idea of the post-colonial becoming something that we um, not embrace. I mean, the, the, the colonial period is something of a, a blot. And when I say something of a, you know, I'm being slightly, uh, I'm understating it, but something of a blot on our collective past, um, uh, well, my, my, my country's past. Um, and yet there's no advantage anymore in laboring under kind of, that's right. Self-flagellation, which is not really honest anyway, if we're honest no. with ourselves. It's not really, no one really, is, if I beat myself in the back, do I not have to say sorry? You know what I mean? It's like, um, so, so there, is this, there is this moment where, where we have this opportunity, I think, to bring it home and to start actually uh, occupying this history. And then we can make it. The self-flagellation as an alibi to not do the cross-cultural work, the difficult Mm. Work, the embarrassing work that needs to be done. Uh, 
Yeah, you know, the embarrassing work that needs to be done. I kind of like that. I think that's a good point to finish on. I really like that. Um, thank you ever so much, all of you, uh, Daniel, um, Vikram, and uh, Maristella, for, for for speaking to me and for for the book and um, for your time and your thoughts. Thank you, Ambrose. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. I've really enjoyed. It's been taken a bit of time to get to get uh, us together, but we did it. I'm very glad we did it because the, the conversation touched on very important many aspects. Um, and even among the three of us, we don't have much the opportunity to talk, but this what we touched at the very end, it's also very, very important, Ambro. <laughs> yeah. So the, the design, it's part of our reality. <laughs> well, it just it just suddenly struck me. We don't talk about the possibilities of a post-colonial design praxis. And I think this could be really, really, a really invigorating no. game to play. I mean, one of the things I've noted in conferences recently is that there's very little energy in the room at the moment. There's a lot yeah, of, okay. there's a lot of exhaustion. There's a lot of yeah. fear. People are very cautious. Yeah. No one is exciting anybody and and i think that starting to think it in a really dynamic and positive way about the possibilities that this complexity and these difficult memories histories present to us could be the yeah. thing that kicks off another exciting phase let's hope you know i, I try and introduce you know we we kind of missed the boat when postmodernism went down the road of uh, new urbanism <laughs> etc you know mm -hmm. What if, if it, at the same time, you know, our fantastic British punk fashion designer, Alexander McQueen, was going, ape, you know, just going crazy, cracking open every possible can, including the, uh, the in, you know, this, this cultural appropriation can. You know, he, he went to Japan and, and he made those things his own and sort of made amazing things out of it. He went to India, he went to Africa. I don't know, he went to all these places, but he was very happy to embrace uh, uh, all these uh, uh, edge, edge conditions. Mm -hmm. And he did it in partly because he identified himself fictionally as being, uh, you know, British England anyway. You know, he claimed to be Scottish, uh, like, like you. Uh, 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 but, but, you know, punk for me, the whole sort of punk postmodernism never made it to architecture. And I think that might be a place to like really upset a few things and see mm -hmm. how, how one might stir the pot. You're going to teach, are you going to teach some punk postmodernism at, at, uh, Drexel? Some punk, then? punk modernism. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Very good. Thank you ever so much. Goodness, that was wonderful. Thank you to Maristella, Vikram and Daniel for their time and for the generosity and elegance of the discussion. Thanks also to them and to Fran Ford at Routledge for the book Rethinking Global Modernism. Please see the podcast description for links to their professional profiles and to the book itself. And don't forget to like, subscribe, follow and share. Ears for architecture everywhere. Cheers. <laughs>